A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court by Mark Twain, Chapter 21, The Pilgrims. When I did get to bed at last, I was unspeakably tired. The stretching out and the relaxing of the long, tense muscles, how luxurious, how delicious. But that was as far as I could get. Sleep was out of the question for the present. The ripping and tearing and squealing of the nobility up and down the halls and corridors was pandemonium come again, and kept me broad awake. Being awake, my thoughts were busy, of course, and mainly they busied themselves with Sandy's curious delusion. Here she was, as sane a person as the kingdom could produce, and yet, from my point of view, she was acting like a crazy woman. My land, the power of training, of influence, of education, it can bring a body up to believe anything. I had to put myself in Sandy's place to realize that she was not a lunatic. Yes, and put her in mind to demonstrate how easy it is to seem a lunatic to a person who has been taught as you have been taught. If I had told Sandy I had seen a wagon, uninfluenced by enchantment, spin along twenty miles an hour, had seen a man unequipped with magic powers get into a basket and soar out of sight among the clouds, and had listened, without any necromancer's help, to a conversation of a person who was several hundred miles away, Sandy would not merely have supposed me to be crazy, she would have thought she knew it. Everybody around her believed in enchantments. Nobody had any doubts. To doubt that a castle could turn into a sty and its occupants into hogs, would have been the same as my doubting among Connecticut people the actuality of the telephone and its wonders, and in both cases would be absolute proof of a diseased mind, an unsettled reason. Yes, Sandy was sane, that must be admitted. And I also would be sane to Sandy if I would all, if I would be, if I also would be sane to Sandy I must keep my superstitions about uncharted and unmiraculous locomotives, balloons, and telephones to myself. Also, I believe that the world was not flat and hadn't pillars under it to support it, nor a canopy over it to turn off a universe of water and occupied all space above. But, as I was the only person in the kingdom afflicted with such impious and criminal opinions, I recognized that I would be good that it would be good wisdom to keep quiet about this matter too if I did not wish to be suddenly shunned and forsaken by everybody as a madman. The next morning Sandy assembled the swine in the dining room and gave them their breakfast, waiting upon them personally and manifesting in every way the deep reverence which the natives of her island, ancient and modern, had always felt for rank. Let its outward casket and the mental and moral contents be what they may. I could have eaten with the hogs if I had 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 birth approaching my lofty official rank, but I hadn't, and so accepted the unavoidable slight and made no complaint. Sandy and I had our breakfast at the second table. The family were not at home, I said. How many are in the family, Sandy, and where do they keep themselves? Family? Yes. Which family, good my lord? Why, this family, your own family. Sooth to say, I understand you not. I have no family. No family? Why, Sandy, isn't this your home? Now, how indeed might that be? I have no home. Well, then, whose house is this? Ah, oh, wit. Well, I would tell you, and I knew myself. Come, you don't even know these people? Then who invited us here? None invited us. But we came, that is all. Why, woman, this is a most extraordinary performance. The effrontery of it is beyond admiration. We blandly march into a man's house and cram it full of only really valuable nobility the sun has not yet discovered in the earth, of the only really valuable nobility the sun has yet discovered in the earth, and then it turns out that we don't even know the man's name? How did you even venture to take this extraordinary liberty? I supposed, of course, it was your home. What will the man say? What will he say? Forsooth, what can he say but give thanks? Thanks for what? Her face was filled with a pu with a puzzled her face was filled with a puzzled surprise. Verily, thou troublest mine understanding with strange words. Do ye dream that one of his estate is like to have the honor twice in his life to entertain company such as we have brought to grace his house withal? Well, no. When you come to that, no. It's an even bet that this is the first time he has had a treat like this. Then let him be thankful and manifest the same by grateful speech and due humility. He 
he were a dog, else in the air an ancestor of dogs. To my mind, the situation was uncomfortable. It might become more so. It might be a good idea to muster the hogs and move on. The day is wasting, Sandy. It is time to get the nobility and be moving. Where for, fair sir and boss? We want to take them to their home, don't we? La, but list to him. They be of all the regions of the earth. Each must hie to her own home. When do we might do all these journeys in one so brief life as he hath appointed that created life, and thereto death likewise, with help of Adam, who, by sin, done through persuasion of his helpmeet, she being wrought upon the betray upon the bereaved, by the beguilement of the great enemy of man, that serpent hight Satan aforetime consecrated, and set apart unto that evil work by overmastering spite and envy begotten in his heart through fell ambitions that did blight and mildew a nature erst so white and pure, when so it hove with the shining multitudes its brethren born in glade and shade of that fair heaven, wherein all such as native be to that rich estate and great Scot, my lord. Well, you know, we haven't got time for this sort of thing. Don't you see? We could distribute these people around the earth in less time than it is going to take you to explain that we can't. We mustn't talk. Now we must act. You want to be careful. You mustn't let your mill get the start of you that way. At a time like this, to business now, and shops the word. Who is to take the aristocracy home? Even their friends. These will come for them from the far parts of the earth. This was lightning from a clear sky of unexpectedness, and the relief of it was like a pardon to a prisoner. She would remain to deliver the goods, of course. Well then, Sandy, as our enterprise is handsomely and successfully ended, I will go home and report. And if ever another one... I also am ready. I will go with thee. This was recalling the problem. How? You will go with me? Why should you? Will I be a traitor to my knight, dost think? That were dishonor. I may not part from thee until in knightly encounter in the field some overmatching champion shall fairly win and fairly wear me. I were to blame, and I thought that that, that might ever hap. Elected for the long term, I sighed to myself. I may as well make the best of it. So then I spoke up and said, All right, let us make a start. While she was gone to cry her farewells over the pork, I gave that whole peerage away to the servants, and I asked them to take a duster and dust around a little where the nobilities had mainly lodged and promenaded. But they had considered that they would be hardly worth a while, and would moreover be a rather grave departure from custom, and therefore likely to make talk. A departure from custom, that settled it. It was a nation capable of committing any crime but that. The servants said they would follow the fashion, a fashion grown sacred through immemorial observance. They would scatter fresh rushes in all the rooms and halls, and then the evidence of the aristocratic visitation would be no longer visible. It was a kind of satire on nature. It was the scientific method, the geologic method. It, depend it deposited the history of the family in a stratified record, and the antiquity could dig through it and tell by the remains of each period what changes of dirt the family had introduced successfully for a hundred years. The first thing we struck that day was a procession of pilgrims. It was not going our way, but we joined it, nevertheless, for it was hourly being borne in upon me now that if I would govern this country wisely, it must be posted in the details of its life, and not at second hand, but by personal observation and scrutiny. This company of pilgrims resembled Chaucer's in this, that it had in it a sample of about all the upper occupations and professions the country could show, and a corresponding variety of costume. There were young men and old men, young women and old women, lively folk and grave folk. They rode upon mules and horses, and there was not a side saddle in the party, for this specialty was to remain unknown in England for nine hundred years yet. It was a pleasant, friendly, sociable herd, pious, happy, merry, and full of unconscious coarseness and innocent in indecencies, 
what they regarded as the merry tale, went the continual round and caused no more embarrassment than it would have caused in the best English society twelve centuries later. Practical jokes worthy of the English wits for the, of the first quarter of the far-off nineteenth century were sprung here and there yonder along the line and compelled to the delightedest applause. And sometimes, when a bright remark was made at one end of the procession and started on its travels toward the other, you could note its progress all the way by, sparkling by the sparkling spray of laughter it threw off from the boughs as it ploughed along, and also by the blushes of, mules in, of the mules in its wake. Sandy knew the goal and purpose of this pilgrimage, and she posted me. She said, They journey to the Valley of Holiness f for to be blessed of the godly hermits, and drink of the miraculous waters, and be cleansed from sin. Where is this watering place? It lieth a two-day journey hence, by the borders of the land that hight the Cuckoo Kingdom. Tell me about it. Is it a celebrated place? Oh, of a truth, yes. There be none more so. Of old time there lived there, there an abbot and his monks. Belike were none in the world more holy than these. For they gave themselves to study of pious books, and spoke not the one to the other, or indeed to any, and ate decayed herbs, and not thereto, and slept hard, and prayed much, and washed never. Also they wore the same garment until it fell from their bodies through age and decay. Right so came they to be known of all the world by reason of these holy atrocities, of these holy austerities, and visited by rich and poor, and reverenced. Proceed, but always there was lack of water there, whereas upon a time the holy abbot prayed, and for answer a great stream of clear water burst forth by miracle in a desert place. Now were the fickle monks tempted of the fiend, and they wrought with their abbot unceasingly by begging and beseeching that he would construct a bath and when he was become a weary and might not resist more, he said, "Have ye your will then, and granted them they a that they asked, and granted that they asked. Now mark thou what tis to forsake the way of ways of purity, the which he loveth, and wanted with such as be worldly and an offence. These monks did enter into the bath and come thence washed as white as snow." And lo, in that moment his sign appeared in miraculous rebuke, for his insulated waters, for his insulted waters, ceased to flow and utterly vanished away. And there we will pause.